where are my sports fans here today? Can I, can I get an amen? Any, where are my non-sports fans? Raise your hand. Uh-oh, okay. Um, as you might have guessed, my favorite sport is football, and it's, it's not, I'm not a love the football because I want to go tailgate and eat a bunch of fat food and have a hangover the next day and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and again, no shame, no blame to folks, but for me, I love the strategy of the game. One of my uh, side hustles is I actually analyze football games, and it's so fun. I love the intricacies of the game, the little, the little nuances of the game, and so I'm going to teach you a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to go into great depth, but so... The object of football is they take this pigskin ball and they try to move it downfield. There's 11 players on the field and they try to move it all the way down and score what's called a touchdown, okay? And so that, when you have the ball, it's called offense. Everybody say offense. offense. Well, when an offense is really cooking and that means like they're flowing, I mean, they're vibing, they're, they're, they're just matriculating down the field. Many times, the defense, so that's the other players that are trying to prevent that, in fact, there's a defensive coordinator up in the skybox, and he's looking down. He's like, bro, I got I to gotta get crazy right now and call a coverage called cover zero. Everybody say cover zero. Cover zero, cover zero what it does is it enables a defensive coordinator to blitz everybody and play man-to-man coverage. Oh, golly, I should, okay, I'm going too much. There, let me just say, oh, do we have it? Okay, perfect, perfect. So... Everybody's like trying to like sack the quarterback and get the ball and knock it off and all that kind of stuff. And I started thinking, I, I love the aggressiveness. I love the, the X's and O's and the, and, the, and the chess game between, you know, the offensive coordinator, the guy that calls the offensive plays, and then the defensive coordinator. I just love that whole part of the game. And what I started thinking about when I'm reading Acts, you're like, where are you going with this, Pastor. When, when you see the book of Acts, what the book of Acts is, it really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles or through the early disciples. So remember, Jesus dies, he resurrects, he hangs out with the homies for 40 days, and he's like, all right, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit, he bounces back to heaven, wait, till, wait in Jerusalem until I give you power of the Holy Spirit, and Pentecost, the festival of Pentecost comes, and he does that. The, the early believers, they obey, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and dude, Peter, the one that, that betrayed Jesus, has the privilege of redeeming himself. He preaches, and 3,000 people, you talk about altar call, imagine 3,000 people coming to get saved at the end of this encounter. That's really what happens. And so the early church starts and dude, it, talk about momentum. It's like an offense that's just cooking. I mean, it's matriculating down the field. And the Holy Spirit is working in a powerful way. I mean, Acts chapter three, isn't that cool? They, they're going to the, the church for like a prayer meeting. And Peter and John see this, this beggar begging for money. He's crippled. And they're like, you know what? I'm not gonna give you money. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Just grab his hand. How about that? Wouldn't that be dope? Like, you know, someone just rolls it, pick him up. And, and the Bible says, like, as he gets up, like, the ankle just, whoop, like, gets into place and just strengthens. So dope. In chapter four, they're preaching, and they put him in prison. And, you know, I mean, talk about, like, early momentum in the church. And what you got to know, and this is not just for love church or the global church. This is for you as a person. This is for you as a family. Just know, when God's spirit takes control and starts moving through you, just know that the enemy, the defensive coordinator, is gonna do whatever he can to stop the momentum. And so, the title of the message, you can jot it down, is called Holy Audibles. And what does that mean? That means... If I see the enemy, if the defense, of the, they're, it's full cover zero, they're making, they're, they're gonna blitz, I have to call an audible. I have to be aware of the attack and actually change the play so I can be successful. So that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna look at the enemy's 
I don't know, game plan to stifle your life, this church's life, and we're gonna make some holy audibles. We're gonna be aware. We're not gonna be scared of that, but we're gonna be aware of that. And then we're gonna make some adjustments. Does that sound okay? Okay, so let's start with number one. Uh, and I had to look this word up, but write it down in your notes. The first um, cover zero blitz of the enemy, pretension. Pretension. It's with an S, I think. Hopefully I got this right. Pretension. You'll, you'll understand the meaning of it as we dive in. Acts chapter five, verse one. Acts chapter five, verse one. So again, for context, the church is flowing, they're growing, and Acts chapter five, but, you always hate when the text starts out with a but. You know something's happening. But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the, the apostles claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Pete said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. After selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. Now, I'll pause there real quick. What, what is happening? I gotta give you some context. So in chapter four, we understand that the church, were, there was such a generous church they saw a lot of the early Christians become persecuted and they became poor. So what they would do is they would sell like parcels of land and homes to make sure that they could bring it to the church and the church would distribute it to some of the poor people so everyone had food to eat, everyone had shelter. And so at the end of chapter four, I won't read it for you, but you've, you've read it, but basically there was a dude named Barnabas that did that. They nicknamed him son of Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And Barney, this Barney dude was a generous guy. He brought it to the apostles' feet. And a lot of scholars submit that Ananias and Sapphira were probably looking and, and, and they're like, dude, that's pretty cool. Look, did you see the reaction of the church when Barney gave that money? And, and a lot of people think maybe there was some insecurity and Ananias and Sapphira, so they see this going on and they're like, well, dude, that's pretty cool. Maybe we'll give some, but we'll pretend that it's this whole amount, which really will hold some back. So now they'll, they'll think we're pretty sweet, but we don't have to have full sacrifice. <laughs> and I was thinking, wow. The early church, by the way, it wasn't uh, communism, it was communism. There's a difference. Communism is forced, communism is voluntarily. Communism is, listen to this, what yours is mine, but communism is what's mine is yours. And so there was this tricky thing happening in the early church. And I truly believe that the insecurity led to this hypocrisy. And so here we go, they're, they're acting like this, it's pretentious, they're, they're, they're claiming to be someone, and we've all been there, by the way, come on now, don't be, don't be, don't be like acting like you haven't done that, right? I mean, some of y'all, like, you wear, you know, shoes that are a little bit higher to make, you know, it's like, it's the whole bait and switch. You're like, you get married, you're like, I thought you were like 5'8", you know? <laughs> She's 5'2", how'd that happen? <laughs> We've all been there. We've all done that, right? So what was the result? Verse five, as soon as Ananias heard these words, oh my goodness, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone, can you imagine like, if us as Christians come in with our little smiley face, like everything's good, you know, and like the minute we're hypocritical, pff, everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, took him out, and buried him. I mean, did you read this this week and go like, whoa, God, that's, that's a little dicey. Everybody say, yikes. Yikes. That's what I, I read it. I literally 
physically just, yikes. I mean, if God dealt with me and my hypocrisy, my pretension, like these dudes right here, I would be smoked, I'd be slain in the spirit. <laughs> Blessed subtraction. I mean, whatever you want to call it, I'd be out. Would you? Is there any school teachers in here, by the way? Any school teachers? I, I have a question for you, okay? When you set your class rules day one, and you got that honorary kid that was me, do you like make a, like an example? Like, hey, if that's fine. If you choose to do this, then you will do that. Anybody? Why do you do that? It's not that you hate the kid or you hate the classroom. It's you got to set the precedence from day one. And so I believe the Holy Spirit was very, very clear to say, hey, we can't let this, like, this is going to kill the church early, so we got to set a precedence right away. I'll give you an example. When one of our boys was in eighth grade, which was his first year in public school, we needed to set a precedent early. And I got a report that he was, dis I think it was, he was disrespectful to one of his teachers, and he got a detention. And, you know, again, we're not perfect parents, but by God's grace, we raised them in the word of God and, and major thing, like look people in the eyes, you know, like if they say jump, you say how high, Coach Kyle, like that's just how, and so it really hurt my heart. And I'm like, we, I can't let this, I gotta make it sting early. Pro tip, by the way, as a parent, tons of love, tons of discipline, consistency throughout, make it sting. We used a wood cheese, wood cheese cutting board not out of anger, but out of discipline. You do what you want. Teenage daughters, one, you know, one outfit for two weeks is a really good way to sting it. <laughs> um, just give me some pro tips real quick. So for us, I was praying. I was like, I don't, this is, I don't want this to get out of hand. I gotta nip this in the bud because I care for him and I care about you know, Jesus and his example being in that school. And so it was, it was kind of cold out too. I said, bro, I said, I love you, but you're gonna have to walk home from school today. Now, <laughs> it was about a two hour walk. I'm just gonna tell you. It wasn't like he walked two minutes. And it's funny because D Money deployed a bunch of friends to like drive by and make sure like that he's okay. <laughs> like, I'm like, dude will figure it out. He's a wrestler. I mean, if someone attacks him, I don't know. Like, <laughs> and everybody wants to know what twin it was, and I'll let you guess. So, but I think that's what's happening in the text. I mean, God cares so much about right this early church. He's gotta. He's gotta make an audible. He, he, he's got to keep the momentum going. If he doesn't do something quick, he's got, he's got to prune the pretension is what he's got to do. He's, he's got to kill the compromise. He can't let that go, so he makes an example early on. And it's not just Ananias. <laughs> Look what happens to Sapphira, man. Poor girl. Verse seven, about three hours later, <laughs> most scholars submit that she was out shopping. <laughs> she pocketed some of that money right there, so... Three hours later, she comes in from her shopping spree. Just, I'm messing with you. Okay, not knowing what happened, Peter asked her. So Pete literally has a gift of like the word of knowledge. If you look in 1 Corinthians 12, it's the spiritual gift of word of knowledge. It's this supernatural gift to know something that you shouldn't know. And so Pete has this gift and he's expressing it. Was the price you and your husband received for your land, was this the price? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, she replied, that was the price. And verse nine, Peter said, well, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door. They're gonna carry you out too. Pete, that's raw, bro. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And look at verse 11. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard 
what had happened. So the goal, I think, was, again, it, I don't think it's like I'm out to get you. I think it's like, man, we got to do something early because if we don't, that cancer is going to spread everywhere and it's going to dismantle the church too early. And, and we have a mission. We, we have a mission. And so I, I just thought I would ask the question, where is, because it, 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 this hit me, it said, Peter asked him, when did you let the enemy come in? So, so what I, thought, I started thinking to myself is like in seasons of compromise and pretension in my own life, it, I don't, it's not like I open up this wide door, it's a little crease. It's a little crack in the door. It's just a little compromise. This isn't gonna, this is okay. God will forgive me. It's just a little crease that happens in my life. And then all of a sudden, the enemy gets a little crease in and he starts taking over. And so I, I, I felt the spirit just speaking to the church because I, I want all of us to participate. Where are the little compromises in our life right now? Where's the little compromises in our family? Where are the little compromises in this church, in the global church? And I'm gonna say this, we, either we kill them or it kills us. Right here, he's like, I gotta be like on it, not out of mean, but out of love. And it does, I mean, you, you name it. We all have our little compromises. It's a crack. Jesus was really good. He said, look at Matthew, Matthew 18, eight, jot it down. He says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. So kill it. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. So he's, he's, Jesus is just basically saying the same thing. Get aggressive with whatever that little pretentious, we gotta prune the pretension, kill the compromise, get it out. That's the audible if we wanna continue to move the gospel down the field in your family life, in your personal life at this church. Don't presume on the grace of God and the patience of God. And I've made that mistake before. We gotta repent and turn. Not because he's out the gate, but man, there's something better. Let's continue to move down the field. So that's the number one. Number two is uh, division. Division. Golly. Let's just read it. Acts chapter six. Starting in verse one. <laughs> so this happens, a little, little pruning, a little killing. And so when you prune something, now it grows even more. And that's what you see right here. But, the, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, and I, when you're reading multiplied, I love how God's mathematics are so cool, right? Like he first starts adding to the church daily those who are being saved, and now all of a sudden you go from 3,000 to 5,000, and now it's just multiplying. And then he, he can subtract if he needs to, just like he did with Ananias and Sapphira. But he's not in, into division. As the believers rapidly multiplied, <laughs> there were rumblings of discontent. That's, that's you parents that you're crazy, and you, you go from two to kids to three kids and then three to five, and then all of a sudden you're like, dude, you know what, we'll go for starting five and a sub, and you have six kids. You talk about rubblings of discontent. That's my mac and cheese, punk, right? It's like, what? The Greek-speaking believers complained. I underlined that in my Bible. The believers complained? I thought that was a mutually exclusive idea. We don't complain as believers. We're stinking grateful for the grace of God. Are you kidding me? You've given me breath and salvation. I don't complain. I just brag on you. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. I read this in the message, and it says, during this time, the disciples were increasing in numbers by leaps and bounds, hard feelings developed. It's like the great prophet Big E, mo money, mo problems, right? It's like, mo people, mo problems. We, with growth comes grumbling. With complexity come complaints. That's why consultants get compensated well. 
because they go into a situation that's growing and there's a bunch of chaos and they come in and they provide solutions. This has been really our story from day one. By God's grace, he's just multiplied and added people to the church. And if I'm really honest with you, it's been tough because there has been neglect and miscommunication it's not because we want to. It's, man, as, it's just harder and harder. When, when you have 50 people at the church, it's much easier to keep a good pulse on what's going on in people's lives. What's happening is so you could go visit people. Like, when you go from 50, though, to I don't know, it just gets harder and harder, and that's what's happening here. But you can have a choice. You can stay at 50, or you can go, man, we want to reach as many people as we can with the goodness of Jesus Christ. We want to help as many people as we can. And we know with that is going to come a little bit of chaos, a little bit of mess. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs, write this down, Proverbs 14, 4. <laughs> Without oxen, a stable stays clean. But you need a strong ox for a large harvest. <laughs> You're like, dude, that ox is stinky. Get him out of here. I need every, man, this, I'm preaching to myself right now. I need everything in order. I have two pairs of shoes in my closet. That's it. it it's like, then you're like, whoa, what? This is a mess. And I can either lean in and go, okay, that's off, and these poor folks are getting neglected. We, we either, either A, I'm done, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Or B, we got a problem, let's come together to provide a solution. That's really our only, only questions. And I would just say this, and this is not just for church, but this is good for business. If you have the gift of consultant and you can see a situation, here's my humble request, and this is probably gonna help you. I'm, I'm giving you some good professional advice as opposed to going into your work and complaining about all the problems, here's, here's my suggestion. Humbly go to your direct report and say, hey, I don't know if you've noticed this, I've noticed this, and here's, here's a problem, and I've come up with three solutions that I'm willing to participate with if you'll allow me the privilege. Can you imagine the workplaces in our town or our churches as a poet, man, that, that, that first song, man, fire, fire. Da, na, 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 na. What? How about this? You know, I want to provide a solution. Man, I was jamming to this one worship song. Here's two or three. Matter of fact, I can play drums. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Man, why is that manager always doing that? Yeah. Direct report. I'm telling you, it could change an entire family. It could change a business. It could change a church. And this is the audible they made. Look at verse two. So good. So the 12, these dudes that this complaint's going on, the, the 12 called a meeting. Sometimes that's what all you need to do is have the courage to go, can I just have a meeting with you? Can I just look at you in the eye, Kyle, and be like, Kyle, I'm so grateful, man, how you train our, our staff. But man, you kill us a little bit too much, bro. I got a solution for you, one, two, or three. <laughs> actually, I do the opposite. I, I actually audio text them very regularly and be like, thank you so much for encouraging and challenging our team. We get to sweat together, stay on the same page. Man, thank you, and I honor you for your service. But here's their solution. They called a meeting, all the believers, they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running the food program. Not saying that the food program is a bad thing, right? And so, brothers, here it is, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. Underline this next thing in your Bible, we will give them the responsibility so you got meeting and delegation. Division is the enemy's weapon. That's the defensive coordinator sending cover zero blitz. It's, it's division, and the remedy is delegation. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. 
this was big for us, man. As we first started the church, I was the lead pastor, the youth pastor, the uh, bookkeeper, the janitor, you name it. And the beauty of the body of Christ is if it's his work, he just continues to add people that are gifted, way more gifted than I am in so many different areas. And what ends up happening is, is you start delegating and building. And by the way, as you notice what kind of people they were? Full of the spirit and wisdom. And you're like, for a food program? Yes, for a food program. In fact, that's how we actually screen a lot of our key leaders. We say, let's go put them in the back behind the scenes and see if they can be consistent behind the scenes before they ever see the stage. He who's faithful in little will be entrusted with much. Great training ground. And so that's what they do. They, they have this meeting. They're like, you know what, man? Let's, let's delegate. Let's build a team of solid people. Let's give them this responsibility. How do you think the meeting went? Look at verse five. Everyone liked the idea. Don't you love those meetings, by the way, where you walk away, you're like, everybody's like, yeah, that made a lot of sense. Everyone liked the idea. They chose the following. Stephen, who you read about in seven, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Big Phil, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parm Parmenas, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch. Verse six, these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. And here it is, look at verse seven. So God's message continued to spread. They continued to matriculate down the field towards the touchdown of seeing more souls saved. Greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. I love the result for many reasons. Number one, those who were being neglected by, not, by the leaders not having enough bandwidth to care properly for them, now they were gonna actually be served well and cared for. That's number one. And I just think about this church. Like, my wife and I sat down with a woman who was really going through a really tough season this week. And one of my main questions to her was, are you in a women's group? Are you surrounded by people you know, she's in a really, really dicey situation. And as much as I'd want you to move into my home and for us to, you know, care for you and, and help you, it's like, who is that person? Who are the people that are being raised up so now people are, are able to care well? Number two, I love it, new servant leaders are in the game. Yeah. Touch your neighbor, say, get in the game. Yeah. Some people just come to church and leave church, come to church and leave. Listen, there are so many needs in the church. I promise you, just get in the game. And when you do, I'll never forget, uh, my buddy Mickey Marijuana Caruana, he tapped me on the shoulder. He's like, I was coming to church for a year at Calvary Fort Lauderdale. He tapped me on the shoulder. He's like, yo, uh, come and serve at youth ministry. And I showed up, and I'm in middle school ministry with a bunch of geeky sixth grade kids. And I, and I just, and all of a sudden, I loved them. And I'd come up on Tuesday, we'd shoot hoops together. And listen, if no one taps me on the shoulder like Mickey, I'm not standing on the stage today. So you think about, you go, dude, some people in this church, they just, need to, they just need you to tap their shoulder. Just come on in. What can I do? I don't know the Bible. I, don't, I, don't, I can't talk. What? You can do something. You can get in the game. You start serving, and, and maybe you're faithful behind the scenes, and who knows what God does with you. Right now, at Love Church North Omaha, one of my best friends, Michael Connell, is bringing the word of God in a part of our city that needs to hear the truth, and Mike is bringing it. And you know what he's teaching from? Acts chapter five, he's bringing the heat right now. I love it. What is that? That's, that's, that's how we expand, that's how we grow, that's how we care for more people. Number three, the leaders were able to stay healthy. If, maybe this is you here today. This is all you need. You came for church for one thing. Here's, here's what it is. You're doing too much. You think that you're, you want to be Superman to everybody, but listen, there's not enough of you to go around, and you're neglecting people on your team who actually have a better gift than you. If you'll be humble enough to give it away, now everybody's healthy for the long haul. We stay healthy. But most importantly, did you get it? God's message continued to spread. 
The drive wasn't stalled. They continued down the field, the gospel field. And that's really the heart at this church. We wanna connect as many people as we can with the heart of Jesus. Listen, and not, not just so we can go to heaven, but man, so we can thrive here on this planet right now. Man, God's word, think about this for a second. He made you. He made me. He's like, dude, I, a good dad's gonna try to set their people up for success. He's like, I got it right here. I made you, I know how you're gonna tick. If you follow me here, I'm telling you, life works. It's not easy, but it works. So pretension, division, finally number three, I only got a few moments, persecution. And I know this was your favorite one. Who loves being persecuted in the name of Jesus? Yeah, just, it's funny because we, I think we, we think persecution is someone makes a comment on our, I don't know, when you're online and you say something for Jesus and they're like, ah, you know, it's like, I'm persecuted. <laughs> and I, I, I don't have enough time, but man, one of these seven dudes that got raised up that was faithful in the daily food program, got, he started growing, he started sharing Christ and powerful, powerful sharing. And the, the Jewish leadership were threatened by him and to the point where they're like, you know what, let's go have some people call some lies about this guy that weren't really true. And they bring him in, and Stephen like doesn't back down. If you read chapter seven, if you haven't, and you're just getting, just go back to chapter seven, he gives a brilliant like review of the history of Israel. I mean, the dude just starts breaking, like the dude knew the scriptures. And he starts giving this like amazing talk Pointing, and he actually kind of was like, you guys killed Jesus, who was your Messiah. So I don't know if everyone wants to hear that. To the point, you talk about being persecuted, they drag him out and they literally start throwing stones at him. I mean, physical stones, pelting him because of his faith in Jesus. We're not talking about a comment right here, we're talking about stones in your grill. And how does he react to that? Let me just read a few. Go to Acts 7. Jump all the way down to verse 57. Let's just get into the story. Because there's, there's one verse that I, I have. To, because the enemy's tactic is persecution, but the audible is prayer. And you're going to see the most powerful prayer, maybe one of the most powerful prayers from any Christian in the Bible right here. Check it out. Verse 57. They, <laughs> they put their hands over their ears. This is when Stephen is preaching, and they're like, I don't want to hear it. You ever hear the Holy Spirit speaking? You're like, la, 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 la. That's what they're doing right here. <laughs> they begin plugging their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him, and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul, to be continued, by the way, who became the greatest gangster in New Testament history. Verse 59 as, here it is, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed. Please underline that in your Bible. And, and, and next time, when they began to, I gotta read this again. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed. Here's what a lot of us Christians do, unfortunately. As they persecuted us, as they said something, not even stoned, as they said something, we began a riot and we began a new chat group or we began something. We got defensive. We got angry. We got, what did, as they stoned Stephen, he prayed. Listen to his prayer. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting. This is how this man goes out. Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Let me read it again. You're getting killed, people. Lord, don't charge them with this sin. How did he learn that? I'm glad you asked. Because when Jesus was hanging on that cross and everybody's reviling and accusing him and saying, if you're really Jesus, hop down off that cross. And he was pinned to that tree for our sin. And, your, and he says, Father, forgive him. Go ahead and say it. They don't know what they're doing. 
Can you imagine if the church today in America could shift from like, ah, oh, you gays, and you this, and you that, and this, and we go, you know what? Oh my goodness, Lord, they don't know what they're doing. Don't charge them against their account. God, will you forgive them? I promise you, man, the church changes. The whole legalism, and I got everything figured out, and you might have good two weeks, man, of like walking with the Lord, everything's good, and all of a sudden, you're kind of like judgy. You didn't read your Bible like me. I smell sin in the camp. (laughs) I'm telling you, you want to stop a drive of God? Just start getting judgy. That thing will halt real quick. No, man, I don't care what you're dealing with. You're, You're welcome at this church, but God loves you enough to actually do something about it and to call you, man, there's something better for you. You don't just stick, stay stuck in it. Those are two different things. I'll, I'll close with this. My wife and I read this book on Audible. It's probably not really reading a book, I guess. It's, we listened to a book on vacation by a lady named uh, Corey Tim Boom. It was called The Hiding Place, and it was a story of a woman and her sister in Holland during the Holocaust, and they would hide Jews in their home. And tragically, Nazi, the Nazis found out about it, and they brought them to this prison camp and were just brutally tortured. I mean, I mean you've read stories. It's just brutal to the point where her sister actually died days before they got freed by soldiers Years later, she went and (laughs) back to Germany to preach about forgiveness. And after she got done preaching, a man came up to her after and said, I was one of the prison guards at the camp that you were at. I've since come to Christ. Will you forgive me? She had a choice at that moment. She shares how it was ice cold in her veins. She didn't feel it at all. You don't forgive because of a feeling. You you forgive because of a choice. And she said that, she's like, I'm just gonna act of faith, just reach out my hand. And she said, as she reached out her hand, he embraced hers and warmth went from her shoulder into that, and she got to say, I forgive you. (laughs) I'm telling you, man, this was her quote. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. What's the audible? It's it's prayer, man. It's forgiveness. So church, man, God's moving the ball down the ball. He, He wants to score, man. He wants to score a lot of souls. It's our great opportunity to recognize the enemy. We make audibles and we continue moving downfield. Amen? Thank you, Lord. It's a great word. Thanks for the book of Acts. Love to see your spirit move and teach us and grow us. All of us in here, we all have room for improvement. We all have little areas of compromise that need to be closed. Man, I know I get judgy at times thinking I got it figured out. So please forgive me for that and get me back on track. And certainly any division, any complaints that are happening right now, we pray we'd have a lot of courage in these days to humbly have great conversations, solutions, and together we we would recognize, no, we're not being divided here, man. We're gonna stay on the same page. We're gonna agree to disagree for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I want to 